And welcome to Zisk of Lady Ada. Hey everybody, it's me, Lamore, also known as Lady Ada, and this is my desk, thus the desk of Lady Ada. This is where the magic happens, where we conceptualize electronics and make them real. Wow, it's like it's like magic kingdom of electronics. Um, with me is also Mr. Lady Ada on camera Hello. control. He'll pop in once in a while to add uh, commentary and flavor. So it's not just me talking to you. There's another person. That's right. This is a special edition uh, from the desk of Lady Ada. Much, Lady Ada, much like we did um, a series with Hackaday mm -hmm. when we were doing some Pi Zero stuff, this is a series that we're doing with Maker.io, powered by DigiKey, and they're our launch partner with Circuit Playground, and we're going to show our work. Yeah. So How um, does this happen? Yeah. And uh, I guess... Uh, I guess we could start off with when you come up with something, you have a concept. Mm -hmm. And if you go to maker.io, they uh, did a good job of putting all the things together. You have a concept, research, evaluation, design, prototyping, funding, marketing, production, distribution, support. And so uh, this is much like your desk lady. Yeah, that's like my desk. <laughs> my desk is not tilted, but I do have the same lamp. Yeah. And, um, you know, what's interesting is, you know, we look at a lot of crowdfunding campaigns and they always have like concept drawings and they have like these really like, you know, they look like drafted drawings of like a wearable or a, a watch or a, or like a dog pedometer or whatever. And that's exactly not how I do my engineering concept work at all. It's, it's actually kind of backwards. Like I never have this beautiful drawing. Instead, I look at what's needed, what's wanted, what I can do, what other people are doing. And it's like a more like a salad spinner where I kind of like, I mix all this stuff together up in a, you know, a, a big bowl. And then like, I kind of see what pops out. So it's not as Elegant. I think, you know, people think of like, oh, it's a concept, like a fashion designer, like draws the concept. But even when I did sewing, like I would actually just go to the fabric shops and just feel what fabrics were around. And then I'd get ideas from the material. So it's a little bit, a little bit different, but I think that's how engineers do their concepts. It's how they, they look at what parts are available, what people are doing in the engineering space by checking out like blogs and, and tutorials and video series like maybe this one and then they get inspired by what other people are doing and, and they match that up to you know this puzzle that they have in their mind of, of something they want to build and when that final piece drops in they're like I'm ready to go so it, it's a here. little bit different I'm going to appear so here's the thing um, I've never heard an engineer talk about a concept on how they came up with the device. This is usually hidden. You never get a chance to talk to the engineers. And if they do, they they often lie. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, like I was the, in the shower and I was inspired. Right. The, yeah. There's Showing a, your work is one of the the most I think uh, humbling things that any professional can do. Because yeah. you have to show your, you have to show that you looked at something else. Yeah. Like you got ideas. Nothing that I do is like I, I mean it's a weird thing to say but like nothing is original like I didn't come up with this out of nowhere all of it comes from this ecosystem of open source hardware these engineers this community that we have and that's kind of cool because it's so much easier to come up with stuff by getting insp inspiration than trying to create it in a vacuum yeah so that's that's what we're talking about today is this concept of like what was I trying to do when I designed the circuit board? Yeah, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions because mm -hmm. I was there, but I think um, with our you know live audience online, um, I'll also ask questions yes, that they of have course. Yeah. Uh, as you're doing this. Mm -hmm. So um, let's uh, kick it off. Um, like I said, you can go to the website, maker.io. Um, we're in the concept phase right now where we're going to talk about circuit playground. Uh -huh. And I think we went over... Um, your messy, my desk. your messy desk. Yeah. It's funny, there was an article about your messy desk. Yeah, there was. I cleaned up my desk a little bit. Yeah. It's good to clean up and then make it messy again. It's like a yeah. ecosystem. So for the people out there who are thinking of getting engineering, is it okay to have a messy desk? Yes. Okay. All right. How else are you going to keep all these ideas and parts around? Right. But it's also good to clean it once in a while. So, Cleaning it will make you feel good, and then making a mess will make you feel creative. So you have to kind of, right. like the tides... Okay. Messy, so clean. Let's, let's go okay. back in time. The concept of Circuit Playground. Uh, let's uh, travel back. 
Two years. Two years ago. Two years you ago. You were in an event, and this, this is Megan Smith when yes. she was at Google. So this is Megan Smith, who actually we just saw at the White House. She's Chief Technology Officer for uh, United States, and she's just an amazing person. At the time when this photo was taken, she was at Google, and she was, and it was kind of her transition point. She was, um, she had been a mechanical engineer at MIT. Um, I don't remember where she lived or what year she was, but you can you can look that up. And um, she was at Google, and she she kind of uh, spearheaded this made with code idea project concept that Google had. And the idea was for like a year, they ran projects and um, web tutorials and videos and events about getting young people, especially people who were not currently they were. Uh, underrepresented in programming and engineering. So getting more women into engineering, getting more people of color into engineering, getting uh, more people who uh, grew up in a disadvantaged um, family or location, getting them into engineering. And how can we make engineering more inclusive? And that's also what Megan Smith is doing in the, you know, the government as well. Yeah. It's just like, hey, there's a lot of people out there who would be awesome engineers. So like, let's show them how cool programming and engineering is and get them in. Anyways, that's just a background. Yeah. But it was you were just at the White House last week talking about this too. Yeah. So this is kind of full circle. And I think about it a lot. Yeah. This is something, that, and this is part of the concept. I think about it a lot because it's you have to think like, what is the goal? What's the purpose? Yeah. And I was talking with her and some other people at Made with Code at, at this event two years ago, and we were showing off a bunch of projects, some floor projects, which I'll show later, um, some wearable electronics projects to get people interested in showing them how fashion and electronics go well together and they did a fashion show as well and um, the folks at Google said hey can you run a workshop and or like can you design a curriculum so that we can run a workshop and it has to be a workshop that we can run in an hour it has to be run with people who basically don't know any programming at all it should get them basically introduced to electronics and like cost under 20 bucks um, or I think $25 and I said I absolutely don't have anything for you at this time that covers all of these things you know we've got some packs and I'll show them off but I didn't have something that was easy low cost plug and play you know worked with all these different computers didn't require any previous skill and was like 20 25 bucks but after that meeting I was thinking about it a lot and I was like well you know maybe I could take like this Gemma board and then like, combine with it I was, I was kind of it was mixing in my brain for like two years this this puzzle with a missing piece Right, there was this there's this desire for something and I didn't have the perfect thing that would fit in and that's an engineering problem right so I was like okay I'm gonna engineer this thing but the way I, I solve problems like that is I push them into the back of my brain and then um, I wait a while and I keep pushing things into my brain until something pops out <laughs> so this was this was two years ago and um, oh can you um, click on the next yeah. next picky I'll talk about that for a little bit and at the same time, we were... Oh, right. I remember. This, yes. They, they, they contacted us. Yeah. So this was a project. So in the last also like two, three years, we've been getting a lot of media companies that have been contacting Adafruit. Um, we share the same building with White and Kennedy, but also like the, where we are in New York and also just New York itself is a very media-heavy um, city, of course, which is kind of where Mad Men is where it all started. And a lot of these advertising agencies want to do stuff with us and they want to do some sort of interactive projects with like wearables and sensors and electronics and Converse came to us and they, and, and they were like, we really want to do a project where we give away like a hundred things and it's like a wearable thing and it has some sensors and it, it's round and it like, it's kind of like your flora board and maybe a NeoPixel ring um, and it would like do stuff and people could mod their shoes. And this is just an example. This is one that I had a really good photo of because it shows this shoe and then where the Converse logo is, there's um, a NeoPixel ring and, and I think it's a Flora or a Gemma inside and then I think our, our Bluefoot module. Uh, and it's not that this particular, like, oh, Converse, I, like, I wish I had done a project with you, but we were getting a lot of these. We were getting like two or three a week yeah. for a while. I mean, there's a lot of ad agencies and they all wanted to do stuff. And again, they all wanted to do an event or a workshop or a hackathon and they want it to be 20 to 25 dollars they want it to have like some wearable stuff some electronics some interactive yeah. easy to program that they could get out to a lot of people i'm going to flip to the screen since you have um or 
the the you know the the trends here. So yeah. you know, during each one of these, you can get completely distracted if you're an engineering company um, when an advertising agency contacts you because it seems like a fun challenge, mm -hmm. and the concept of Circuit Playground could have just been to fulfill um, a bunch of requests for NeoPixels for a, a brand campaign. Yeah. But instead you wanted to, because you can charge any amount of money, you can, then you're in a service company. So maybe later on we'll talk about the, the marketing and the funding side. Yeah. Because we could have went that way, but instead we decided to make right. a, a product. And what's neat about this example, and I'm like, this conversation is just like, it's a placeholder for like, yeah. the, like 50 to 60 companies that contacted us in the last couple of years. But what's neat about this is that we didn't do this. We didn't actually do a project of commerce. We said, hey, you can buy some stuff. We don't have anything for you. And I didn't have anything for this workshop with um, Made With Code. Yeah. Okay, so can you click on It's funny is everybody did have a, a, one thing that was in common. Mm -hmm. Can we have a friend or $20? <laughs> yeah. And no, because no, yeah. they're like, we, have, we want to get to as many people. We want yeah. it to be cheap. And I was like, okay. like, I could sometimes hit like three of things, yeah. but I couldn't hit like, all Like conferences them. contact us. Often as well. Next, yeah, next slide. So the other thing that happens a lot and has happened in the last ooh, four or five years is um, hacker cons and also just techie cons having badges. And yeah. this is, again, something that you can give away to every single person. It's a standalone device. You don't need any soldering. You can hack it. You can mod it. You can do some stuff with it. Usually it has a decoration. Like these are the DEF CON. I just Googled like hacker badges. This is the you know, first one that I, I popped up that look good and there's like eight different varieties and I think this was um, a propeller parallax chip and they you know got funding and help and, and Waz worked on the ninja badge and again this is something that I never did I never worked on any of these conference badges because I was like kind of busy running Adafruit and I was like I don't have anything that is again about twenty dollars something you can give to everybody that is plug and play that has some hacking and, and and stuff that you can do with it. A lot of these have radios, and that's something that I thought about during this concept phase. But I looked at all these hacker badges because um, they're very interesting. A lot of them actually end up being way more than $20 in, in build materials. And I think a lot of them get, you know, again, we can talk about in funding, but they get assistance from companies that donate chips and components. But there is, you know, that's as we're heading, we're talking about this, I was thinking, like, you know, what else is in this kind of, event, group, um, give one to everybody, they can take it home with them, keepsake, but also functional device. Yeah. So the hacker badges is part of this, because I was, I was seeing all these people do these, and I, again, we never did them, but part of me was like thinking, like, well, is there something that, does this, does this match up? Because yeah. a lot of these, this Converse thing that's made with code event, is this similar? Is this, are these yeah. pieces that fit together? We also just all the time is, we get asked, is there anything that you have for under $20 that you can do at workshops and uh, can you get it to me tomorrow? And is there <laughs> yeah, documentation for everything? Yeah. So documentation for everything. And, uh, oh, by the way, uh, no soldering. Yeah, it's a common thing. So a lot of these things... Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so this is a workshop. Um, this is a Mickey Mickey. This is a Mickey Mickey workshop, yeah. which is which is kind of what I see a lot of people do. So I start seeing like people doing workshops, and the workshops is part of this because a lot of times, like a hacker badge, like when we went to Hope, and they had a hackable badge, and there was a workshop where you would like take the badge and you would do stuff with it, um, but that required soldering and like. But some of these hackathons didn't require that. So this was a Makey Makey workshop. And what I liked about these, and, and when we go to events, we see a lot of Makey Makey workshops. And it's, I they don't think they get to take them home, but it's very easy, plug and play. Um, you know, this is what we often suggest to groups that come to us and say, well, we want something for a workshop that's very easy. Mickey, Mickey, like you basically don't even really need drivers. You plug it in and you're ready to go. And you, know, you can basically get going in 45 minutes. And you can have like a full party. So you have like all these um, conductive pieces and, and tape and foil and coins and alligator clips. So I was seeing a lot of events where we were going to and there were booths set up to do Mickey, Mickey's. And so I was kind of thinking about that as well. as like, okay, well, this is something that's clearly working out because almost every event we've gone to... Yeah. In the last couple of years, has, that isn't a, like a hacker con, has had 
something that can make you make you workshop. Yeah, it's the easiest thing because I think it's easy, easy. Yeah, you have to then get twenty or thirty soldering stations if you want to do something besides mm -hmm. out of the box, yeah. ready to go. Plug in a couple things, and you're off. Yeah. So okay. Well, so there's, what, so there's, we, uh, there was other workshops that you looked at. Yeah. Too. So these are other workshops. So this is another workshop, and this was like a bare conductive paint workshop. And also the conductive paint. So the conductive paint, the makey makey. These were like I'm starting. I start to see these a lot because like, and this was like a a fashion space gallery. So it's like okay, this is kind of interesting. There's these workshops that are being taught to people who have no experience electronics, because all of these groups that wanted you know this giveaway thing, they wanted to run a workshop, and it had to run in 45, 50 minutes. It had to be something very very fast. So I was looking at like what else is very fast. What what can you do in 45 minutes, basically? And um, I should have actually included Jay Chi's uh, circuit stickers. I haven't seen them at workshops, but they would also be a very good um, a device, like for teaching, like a um, like a, the pedagogy of just like sticking stuff down on a piece of paper and then drawing with conductive pen. So this uh, simplicity was something I was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. I also think like it's an evolution of like. The Makey Makey workshops, like Bear Conductive, they had a thing where there's this conductive ink. So you draw, mm -hmm. and then you clip, and then you do something. Or Makey Makey was like, the world is your keyboard. So they're you can see similar. a story. Yeah, you can yeah, see a story progressing. Okay. They're a little similar, but like one, you know, like the Bear Conductive is like you need this extra thing, and you you do more like art. Yeah. But I think they both have a lot of similarities. Yeah, and also bringing people in who maybe this is the first time they're exposed to electronics. How can you have that? The golden 15 minutes of non disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> non -disappointment. All right. Well, um, you used to do workshops when you were a uh, fellow. Do they call everybody fellows? Yeah. By the way? Everyone's a fellow. A lady. Not a fella. Fella. All right. And this is, okay, so this is the holiday hack shop. So yeah. when I. This is for, 10 years ago. Yeah. So this is, I'm not in the photo. They actually didn't have any photos of me. You've been doing this for a while. Yeah. So this is from 10 years ago. Um, right after I graduated from IT, I worked a little bit, and then basically I went right into, um, after a few months, I joined IBM as a fellow, fellow -a, and I um, did open source hardware, and I think even you, you wrote my recommendation letter or something, because like, I knew you back then, and you were like a friend. Um, or maybe you pointed me out to someone who wrote my recommendation letter, but it was awesome. Anyways, that's a blast from the past. And um, I did two holiday hack shops. I, did, I think I did 2005 and 2006, because I think of the year... Yeah ended up being like pretty much because I joined in like November and um, I ran these workshops because they were like okay can you run workshops and at the time I was like okay well what can I run the workshop with um, well all I've got is like I think either Minty Boost or TV Be Gone and so this is what the TV Be Gone um, kit looks like yeah and uh, what's interesting about this is uh, it was very challenging because you had to teach people not only the, some of the concepts of electronics, but now you have to learn how to solder. Right at the time, the, yeah. the workshops that people ran were soldering workshops. Like this was this is like okay. So the photos I showed of the Makey Makey and the like the Bear Conductor that's in the last two years. Ten years ago, the only workshops that people were running were soldering workshops, where you would basically get like twelve soldering irons, and like I ran like half a dozen of these. You get twelve soldering yeah. irons. 12, you know, alligator, uh, um, sorry, diagonal cutters, rolls of solder, wick, third hands, and you just teach them how to solder, and they would build this kit. So they'd build, like, a TV on. So you get a yeah. bag of parts that looks like this. Here you go. Have fun. Right. Good and luck. you'd have to solder it together. And for a long time, this was actually, this was a kind of socially acceptable. It, it, you know, you would, you, the workshop would take two hours, but you would get people soldering. And, and soldering workshops are still of great value. Um, the problem is, is that, if you spend your first 30 minutes learning how to solder and like you have to get everybody's tools and people burn themselves and like, which is fun, um, but you never actually get to teach them any concepts of programming. Like you, you just run out of time. And I think that there is value in teaching soldering workshops, but this is not what people were looking for anymore. Also, 10 years ago, there was no Mickey Mickey. There was no Bear Conductive. There was no Little Bits. There was no Arduino at the time. Yeah, it, like was, it didn't really exist. It, it was really just getting started. It was really getting started. There was yeah. the, the idea, like this, you know, this was using an AT Tiny eighty five. Yeah, I think it was actually the Minty Boost. I don't remember which one I went, did the workshop with, but it was like very, very basic. Yeah, electronics, and it was just fine. I think it, it did a really good job. Yeah. And we this is what everything about. looked like. It's like all right, and this is what it looks like. 
but the problem is, is that all of these places that they were teaching, that all these workshops and these groups that were contacting us, and all these teachers that were contacting us as well, I don't have any photos, but there were teachers who were like, I want to teach this stuff in class. They just did not have enough soldering irons. Every soldering workshop seat would cost $50 in tools, and they just didn't even have that. Yeah. So get it, even if the kit was only 10 bucks, it was like, well, we don't have the tools. You could get them really crappy soldering iron but it was not even worth it yeah. like just it wasn't worth it to to teach people at this high expense i think one of the challenges too is you have a budget you get cheap tools they don't work that well frustrations mount and then people say this isn't for me yeah and you have to try to teach all the concepts of electronics and you only have like you know an hour and you have to uh manage 20 or 30 people and is this really tough yeah. And this is this might be one of the reasons why it took a really long time to get hobbyist electronics to where they are. It mm -hmm. was very like, oh, you have to be an expert. Now it's a little bit easier to, to dip your toes into some conductive ink. <laughs> to do, yeah. So okay, uh, but um but Yeah, then, somebody's but explaining then what time goes yeah. on and then yeah. eventually uh, you've created packs. Right. Which made learning easier, but so when we first started selling challenge. Arduino, we actually had solder. We did, you know, you'd have to solder together some things. Like you'd have to solder right. the battery connector, maybe like a proto shield. But now, like our most popular kit is like the Ardex kits, the Adafruit Ardex kits, like our you know best selling or one of our top selling yeah. um, Arduino kits. I think the starter kit maybe is a little bit more popular. But this one is you know it's all in one. Um, you get an Arduino, which is uh, at this point just so well known as like this is the thing you use. Oh, it just has an Arduino. It's a it's a genericized term almost um, for like this board that you use to get sensor and LEDs and data in and out of your computer. Um, and the Artex kit, you know, comes with a book and it has a USB cable, but it still comes with all those parts. Like those parts are wonderful, and there's nothing really beats having a breadboard. And, and wiring things together because you have them, it's, it's, you can take it so far. Like a, a breadboard and parts kit can take you from beginning to advanced. You know, I only, you know, at, at MIT, we never even learned how to solder. Like it was not a skill that you learned. You actually built a computer on a breadboard. You take um, 6111, a digital lab, it's all done on a breadboard. And that's like a junior, senior level lab class. So you can do a huge amount on a breadboard the problem is, is that you have to teach people how to use a breadboard, how to read schematics, how to do the wiring. And even though this didn't require soldering, so these packs are very popular with schools for a semester-long project, they still have the frustration of you have to teach them so much that... Do you think it's because like there's test-taking? Like it's all about the test-taking, not about the skill? No, this is just what people have used for 50 years. Huh. I'm just wondering why, like, you know, you think MIT that the first, like, day one you're soldering. Oh, why they don't? Oh, yeah. because it's completely um, conceptual learning. In fact, yeah. I don't even know. There's 6, 6004, which is the computer lab where you build a computer. They used to build it with NAND gates on breadboards. Like, you would build your uh -huh. ALU on a breadboard, and you'd build your full computer on um, the nerd kit. And then by the time I took it, they'd actually gone to, uh, like, a VHDL simulation. And so you, you b built your computer completely in software. This is like uh, surgeons never actually being able to do surgery. And then here you go. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to you, you yeah. study in medical school. And then you go and you actually practice as a resident. Yeah, but it sounds like it's moving or it moved towards never even actually building something with your hands. Even less so, yeah. There's even wow. less soldering. So that you're expected to do that on your... Okay. later on so anyway so these packs they're they're very good for teaching but i can never give this to you know made with code or an ad agency because it'd be like uh we just have a bucket of parts like what yeah. what do we do this it, it's really great for teaching people a huge amount of knowledge but it is and, and you can get started quite quickly but it's a little bit overwhelming i think and also um it's a little bit more expensive so you get a lot in this pack, but it's $85. And we have a beginner yeah. pack, but even a beginner kit with Arduino, just because there's so much involved, yep. it's, less, it's hard to get less than 50 So we have like a, a Gemma kit, for example. That's right. We listened, and then we're like, okay, we heard you. So this is as close as I could get with a Gemma pack. It 44 bucks. Comes $44. $45. 50 of them is $27 each. Yeah, this is the reseller pricing. Yeah. I forgot I was long as a reseller. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you get alligator clips, you get batteries, you get all these parts. 
and you can use them with alligator clips. So I'm kind of starting to get into this, like, okay, well, let's like use alligator clips to clip things together. Um, you have a battery in the Gemma, and it's, it's a little bit less expensive. You get some neopixels, but you still have to use thread and needle. So the, the wearables was, okay, you would sew it together. So there's no soldering, and it, was, it is actually quite fun. And people do like the Gemma sensor starter kit. You have these sensors, and you can make basic projects. But the Gemma is a little constraining. It's not fully Arduino compatible, which is a little bit of a downer. On the other hand, it's less expensive. Um, and you do have to sew it together. You can do alligator clips, but it's a little clunky. Like you, you end up having this like spaghetti of alligator clips. But I was getting close. And actually, this um, the Gemma sensor mm -hmm. starter kit is what we ended up sending to a lot of groups that wanted a starter pack that was like under 50 bucks. I was like, okay, well, this is as good as I can get for no soldering, very easy, works on any computer. Um, and is a fairly low cost. So this was kind of getting close. We have yeah. a lot of projects that go with it. And then we saw um, that there were companies out there, and they also moved towards doing packs, mm -hmm. uh, specifically for education. And, and SparkFun is uh, very well known for their SparkFun Inventors Kit, mm -hmm. and it's uh, 99 bucks. Yeah, so this is also a solderless um, parts pack. And it's similar to the Ardex. It has a little bit more stuff in it. It has like a nice case and things. And um, as I think of the book is a little bit longer too, although I, I, have, I don't know for sure. But this is all similar. It's like, you know, it's $100, but you get like an LCD and you get like an Arduino and you get like sensors and you get LEDs and resistors and capacitors and all that good stuff. And again, it's advanced and it's more expensive and it takes you very, very far, but you have to pay more for it. And then, you know, I'm assuming schools get a discount, but it's still like, it's not something that you can give to every single person attending an event. Yeah. I mean, my gripe with um, all these different packs, too, is the market got a little confused because what's the difference between an Arduino and a Redboard? What's the difference between all these things? Right, and, they're and, very compatible. Yeah, and like, how do you know if it's going to work on this? And how do you know it's going to work on that? And so I think for the educators out there, um, they weren't sure what works with what. And the terminologies were changing because the, the, the maker market grew. Yeah. So, okay. And then we also saw, um, speaking of a, uh, an ecosystem, mm -hmm. a, a menagerie <laughs> of boards, um, Grove. Yeah. So this is um, from Seed Studio. I mean, there's, there's also like dozens of other companies doing stuff. I just, I just took like a few examples so I could keep this video reasonable. Um, but so these are, you know, plug and play modules that use cables. And you plug the cables in, so there's no soldering, right? So okay, we're getting, we're getting, and and it's not too expensive. This is fifty dollars, but it doesn't include the Arduino, so you do have to get an Arduino separately, which kind of makes it a little bit more pricey. But I like the idea of like, okay, so you're plugging things together. There's no soldering, and you clip it. You know, if you if you plug it in, it'll just work. And that was to me very um, interesting. And so I didn't end up going this way, but it, I kind of bubbled this in my head of like, well, maybe it would be some something with like plugging cables. Um, problem is the cables, even though they add simplicity, they do make it more expensive because each cable, you know, cables cost money to make. They're not, they're not simple and they have to be reliable and they can't, even though it's not breadboarding, it's not simpler than breadboarding, there's, there's still trade-offs with it. But I like this idea of like, okay, well you, you have all these things and there's no way to wire them wrong, right? Because that's a yeah. common problem. Like people would not, understand how to use a pull-up resistor or they'd have a sensor they'd put in backwards and you can damage it so like uh like how can you make it where you can't wire something wrong because for beginners they can't have they, they should experience the like oh i made a mistake but you don't have time not for 50 bucks not for <laughs> no no it, it, no but what's nice about 50 no, no i'm saying a 50 dollar mistake Right. Yeah. You don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to blow up like. $50 every time you make a mistake. Yeah. You products. don't want to blow up your, your, your dev kit or your expensive sensor. You can do that yeah. later. I mean, trust me, like as an engineer, you will ruin hundreds of dollars of equipment. Um, it's, it's a joy. And they'll get to that. But you want to make it so there's no risk of misplugging. Okay. So then I was like, well, maybe instead of having all these individual, comp individual components are very inexpensive but you have the risk of like plugging in the LED backwards or choosing the wrong choke resistor and, and blowing it up, so it's sad. Mm -hmm. And then there's this plug and play system, which is very interesting, um, but it's a little bit, it adds a little more expense because there's these wires and cables. And also like, is that even necessary? 
like if you want to get started, maybe we'd go more with like the badge thing where it's like a, you know, it's a board and it's kind of like a dev kit all in one. So then yeah. I was thinking like, well, let's, what about an all in one board? Kind of like that, that, that hacker yeah. badge. Oh, before we go on to the yeah. next uh, board, uh, you know, one of the beautiful, I guess, errors or mistakes because Arduino said they didn't initially mean it is the headers and the, the shields, they can only go in one way. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, oh, you know, you should have done something different. I actually like that there could only be one way that they could plug in. I, I like that. It reminds me a little bit of, um, I remember reading somewhere that when we think of things that we like, the things that, that, that we like and we remember, especially um, nostalgia, it, it's the errors and mistakes that give it charm. Mm. So like the hiss of a... Of a a vinyl record. Of a vinyl record. Yeah. That, that's the charming part yeah. of it. But the rough edges are, are the, the valuable thing. Yeah. The not quite perfect. Because uh, there's been... Oh, like a, a million... crystal radio, and you're like, yeah. you can barely hear it. I saw you're... a ton of Arduino, quote, killers down the road, and they're like, we're going to fix shields, and they like, you know, did their own version. And didn't even, but it didn't, doesn't matter. Yeah, nobody, make, nobody makes shields yeah. that aren't anyways. Anyways, okay. So, so standalone boards, because you're like, let's do a standalone board. I yeah. remember this. Oh, this is the Explora. Is this discontinued now? It is discontinued. Okay. It is officially discontinued. Um, but it was a little bit of this, of this idea. I like this thing. Uh, yeah, this is uh, kind of neat. I like that. So, you know, I was thinking like a, making, you know, these plug and play so you can't make the mistakes. But maybe instead of, you know, if it's, if it's a board that you're going to give away to people to learn, what about an all-in-one? It's like a game controller. I know, it's like a game controller, which I, which I thought about. I thought maybe we should make... This board be like a game controller. That you know, it didn't end up being that way, but I thought about it quite hard, and I might make a version that is a game controller because it is um, like a universally understood design for. Like people look at this and they're like, it's a game controller. They understand what it does. So the Explorer was an Arduino compatible, and it was kind of just like chock full of stuff. You can see there's a um, analog joystick on the left, my left, and then um, there's four buttons on the right. So you can like up, down, left, right, A, B. X, Y. Um, on the bottom, there's a slide potentiometer, so that's a potentiometer input. There's a speaker input, so just sound. Um, there is a microcontroller. There's an accelerometer in the center. There's a piezo. Wait, let me see what else. There is, I think there's a, an RGB LED in the bottom left. And there's probably some like temperature sensor or light sensor as well. So this is had a lot of things going on in it. And this is actually kind of the, if you had to pick one thing that was the closest inspiration for Circuit Playground, it would probably be the Explora. Because it's, it's- Really? Yeah, because it actually has the most, this, yeah, and the next thing we'll talk about, yeah. is almost almost identical, other than the joypad. Yeah. One of the things I like about Arduino, and I mean, Arduino CC USA, and specifically the Arduino team is, um, they try a lot of stuff, and some of the stuff doesn't work out. A lot of it does, but some of it doesn't. But it's open source. People get inspired. And if Circuit Playground is one of the things that come out of this, because you had a, an influence mm -hmm. and an and inspiration, that's cool. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Another board that you liked. Well, that oh, the can, board, can right? you go back real fast? Oh, so so I didn't have, uh, because it's discontinued, I didn't have the inspiration, but... One of the things that I think held this back was it was a little bit too clunky and complex. There's a little bit too much going on. And there was these headers and you plugged in things and it was also like not low cost enough. It was like I think sixty dollars or seventy dollars. And I think that was a constraint. Again, you know, this it has to hit this like twenty dollar mark. Okay, so the next board that was a very direct inspiration conceptually was the Pico board. So this is a board that works with scratch. Oh yeah. And this was designed at MIT at the Media Lab, which was in the cube, which was next to me. So I kind of got to see the, the, the lifelong kindergarten group. And the Pico board was also a solderless board that had a bunch of sensors in it. I think it had, oh, I can't see it. So I said a button, a potentiometer, a, a light sensor. Sound sensor button, sound light sensor, sensor, slider. Slider. And it, clips. and it had these alligator clips. Okay, so interesting. They did a different idea that they had special um, cables that were headphone jack cables that went to alligator clips, which I was kind of like, ah, this is interesting. But then again, you have to make custom cables. And I, I kind of wanted to stay away from custom cables. But the Pico board was very interesting because <clears throat> it was designed to, again, be for 
a wide range of students, people who didn't have electronics experience, get them interested in using electronics using Scratch. So one of the things that I wanted to do, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the later steps, was make sure that it worked with Scratch, which is a beginner programming language. It's like drag and drop. Um, now that we have like Blockly, and we have a whole, whole bunch of different things that are similar, but it was kind of the, the originator of the block, drag, clip into place um, programming system, the like non-typing and, programming. And was this, you said it was from the Lifelong Kindergarten Group. Is, yes. this, is this part of the MIT Media Lab? This, yes. Okay. Lifelong Kindergarten is in the Media Lab. And, I, you know, I don't know 100% sure that this was designed in the Lifelong Kindergarten Group, mm -hmm. but Scratch was, and I'm almost positive this was as well. So this was designed there, and then we don't make a Pico board, yeah. but you can actually, you can buy one. So you if you want Pico board, from? you can get one from Starcon. It's so 44 bucks. And it's Pico $44, which is, which is, which is kind of like, I'm getting kind of close here, right? It's like getting yeah. closer. It's, it's closer to $20 than it is to $100. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. Again, it had these alligator clip cables that were a little bit weird, but still this idea of like, okay, it plugs into a computer and you can do stuff with it is, is getting close. Okay, so then, um, and then, you know, because we looked at those other workshops. Yeah. And we started stocking some on our own too. We're like, okay, well. Yeah, so we, yeah, we actually this, stocked the bare conductive board. The bare conductive board. 100 bucks though. Well, it's $100, but it's very interesting. It has an MP3 player built into it. Yeah. It has like a boost a converter and a battery charger. It, it, there's, it's got a lot going on. Yeah. But it's a very full power. It can do quite a lot. Like it has like memory storage and all that stuff on it. Headphone out and amplifier out. And it's meant to be used with um, the bare conductive paint. But I kind of like the edges. It had those big alligator clip pads, mm -hmm. which could also soak up conductive paint. So it's like, okay, that's kind of interesting. It's flat on the bottom. So you can put on a piece of paper and, and draw conductive paint. So even though I don't do a lot of conductive ink projects, I thought about that. Like the fact that it was flat... And it had these maybe alligator clips. Maybe in addition to alligator clips, you're thinking, could you get something to work with conductive ink? Or what? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's wise to think, like, what other mediums can you use? So, like, conductive tape or conductive ink, oh, okay. not just alligator clips. And that's yeah. one of the things I liked have, about this. We have conductive uh, uh, hook and loop. Yeah. <laughs> can't, you can't use the... The V word. Rhymes with Elcro. Yeah. <laughs> can't use that word. But, you, you know, there's other ways to... We have conductive fabric, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Okay. So this is another board, but again, it's it's on the higher side, but it had right. a lot of functionality, which yeah. I thought was interesting. All right, so that's that does everything, but then we blow our price point. We stock it because we really like it. Mm. What else is out there? Okay, so the other things that I was looking at that were bouncing in my head was, I think this was the, the Lily pad. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is the Lily The snap, snap pad. This is actually like, yeah. this is one of like the most brilliant things that SparkFun's come up with. I really like this. Yeah. This idea that you snap off the pieces. On one hand, I was like, well, the problem is people will snap them off and then realize that they didn't mean to. Yeah. So it's a little bit of like the, 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 the a little bit sad. But the overall concept of like, you get this thing, it's an all in one, and you develop with it, and then you snap it apart and then sew it onto your clothing. So this is a, a lily pad, which is, you know, this, the sort of like the, the, um, the archaeological distant cousin of Flora, round circuit board, um, wearable, has these big pads for alligator clips again. Yeah. You know, you can use alligator clips you can sew with thread and needle. One thing that I, that I kind of made me a little sad though is you need this extra board, this, this um, FTDI board yeah. to program it. So it's kind of like, that's one of the things I didn't like about the lily pad. I, I prefer the Flora, which is like all in one. But this is the board. And so we're also, it's not too expensive. It's like $60. We're getting, you know, we're getting close, but I like this idea of like, it's like that badge. You give it yeah, to someone. Yeah, everything, here you go. And it's all in one. And then there's also this. Um, That's right. They, Sparfriend stuck with that um, kind of snap apart. Yeah, but this one doesn't snap sandbox. apart. Yeah, it looks like it does, but it doesn't. Yeah, and this one is also. This was a when I saw this, I was like, "Ooh, that's an interesting idea." This all-in-one board that doesn't snap apart. This has camera. this kind of routed-out shape, yeah. and it's got a lot. It's, it seems to me like it's a derivative of the Pico board. Like if you go back to the Pico board, yeah, it does. I mean, it's got a little bit of the Pico board of the um, the yeah. The one. The, it's got a little bit of that same flavor. It's got the slide pot. It's got the sensors. Yeah. Um, this the thing about this sandbox board which I liked is that it doesn't need, oh, can you go back one? Yeah. It doesn't need anything extra. You yeah, just plug in a USB board. cable. 
And it does have a battery connector, but you can, it has a microphone, it has an RGB LED, it has a slider, uh, it has a button, a light sensor, I think a temperature sensor, and look at LED bar graph, and then anything else? And a switch. Yeah. And so this is kind of like, okay, this is interesting. These are, you know, and SparkFun sells a lot into schools. Like, they have, they have a big focus on education. And so I was like, well, whatever they're thinking of putting onto a board, that's probably, yeah. like, it, it has a lot of overlap with the Pico board. It has this very similar sensor. So I was like, okay, this is, this is what people want when they get but a board. we're back up to, you know, $75. 75 bucks. If you buy 100 or more, $63, well, there's, maybe, there's probably maybe, there's, yeah. maybe there's educators' discounts. But let, let's say, best case it's scenario. It's still 50 We're back at 50 bucks. Yeah, it's still $50. All right. For an educator, maybe less, but yeah. it, it's it's definitely not. It can some, work. It's it's tough for you know if you're holding a workshop, you want to give these away to everybody. Yeah. But we're getting very close here. Yeah. And this I think only came out like a year ago, so like this is this is also timeliney. Yeah. And we're kind of going through the timeline. Okay, and then you have. And then there was also the making. The making making. Which is actually this is not chronological because this came out a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. No, you can skip around a bit. But it's this like Pulp Fiction. Again, this is something that comes with alligator clips. <laughs> you plug in. It's direct. It's Arduino compatible. And that's actually something I'm going to bring up shortly. All those boards that we just talked about are Arduino compatibles because, again, Arduino is this common language. Even if people aren't using the Arduino IDE, it works with Scratch. I think the Pico board is Arduino compatible too. Or it uses a chip that is Arduino compatible. Um, but this, uh, this language of Arduino that people understand, if something can be Arduino compatible, I think it gives it a lot of power. So the Makey Makey, here's something that I liked about the Makey Makey. This is kind of the, the, the concept that I pulled the most out of. First off, you, when you get it, it does a thing. Yeah. Right? You plug in these alligator clips and you, it's actually resistive, not capacitive touch. Whereas the bare conductive board's capacitive. This is resistive. It's just like a slight difference in how the sensing is done. But when you, when you get it out of the box and immediately plug it in, it looks like a keyboard and a mouse, and you start like touching your bananas and, and Play Doh, and it just like it totally works. The thing that you can do afterwards, though, is when you plug it in, you download Arduino ID, you can program it. And I thought that was kind of neat. This idea that it comes with a yeah. default functionality that is useful in and of itself. So, like, I was thinking, like, hey, maybe like the when. This board that I designed, it does something out of the box that's useful. Maybe it acts like a Makey Makey. Maybe it acts like a Pico board. Maybe it runs Fermata, whatever. But, but it's still, um, not to borrow the term, Arduino at heart. You still get to do other things with right. it. Right. It's reprogrammable. And I like that. And this is op also open source hardware, which is kind of neat. Yeah. So, like, Jay Silver, he's also like got, he's also from Life Lock Kindergarten. So, this is, you kind of seeing that there's this, like, there is a theme. There is a little bit of a theme here. Like, it's like people spending decades thinking about how to deliver. Uh, getting started quickly electronics to the most people. It's a theme. Well, for me, yeah. No, for... For, 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 for a lot of people. Yeah, for a few other people. No, lifelong kindergarten. Oh. working on it for decades. Also, Jay is probably in Joy Labs, probably, in, I mean, other other maker-to-market episodes we'll do, we'll talk about marketing, but mm -hmm. I always thought... And I still Great think, marketing. I still think Jay is one of the best marketers because he gives out information, and good uh -huh. information is advertising, and also the videos immediately show what you can do with the Makey Makey. It's and intuitive. That's, and that's what you want to do. It's like, oh, I get exactly what it does. And it looks like a game controller. And it has alligator clips. And it's pretty affordable. No soldering, plug and play, yeah. no extra boards needed. No, like, it, like this simplicity, we're getting there. Yeah. And um, the Mickey Mickey, you get a lot. And it's Arduino compatible and it has these headers on it. And you get a book and it's packaging. And it's, it's getting close to the price, but it's $50, which is, which is good. But, and closer. And they have a Go version, which I probably should have tossed in. So they have a version that's $20 now. Yeah. So that's that's really no, nice. We got one in the mouth. We got one, and yeah. we should, we'll carry it when it's fully released. I'm a backer. And, huh? I'm a backer. We're a backer. <laughs> it's true. No, we're backers. Yeah. But I, and he was looking to try to push that price down because they started at fifty dollars, um, and trying to get that price down. So while we're thinking about all this stuff, some other boards came out. Yeah. In fact. Um, we're kind of doing some live questions. Some of the things I'm asking oh, yeah. are for no, that that's the things that I'm asking. I'm just oh. a I'm just a puppet on behalf of the okay. the audience. Um, someone just said, "What about the code bug?" Right. So then the code bug came out, and yeah. this was this actually, is super cute. So when I heard about this, it was actually a little bit of um, you know when they they talk about um, like the fastest runners. Because you like Phil, you like to talk about the fastest runners. I like, I like. And like, how fast can you bolt. run like a hundred meters now? 
Oh, I haven't timed me. I, 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 I don't know anything about running. I've but, been trying to clear like six and seven minute miles, but like, you know. Oh, how, how long does it take to run a marathon? Like two and a half hours? Depends on your speed. You know, just multiply it out. Four if hours. you can do like eight miles an hour, you know, 26 miles. I don't know anything. Yeah. Anyways. Oh, a couple hours an hour. The diversion. But basically, like, it's just say like somebody, you know, the people run marathons, they run it in six hours. And everybody runs a marathon in six hours, and then suddenly, like, you know, and you can get down to like, like six hours and two minutes, and then like six hours and one minute, like the fastest marathoner, and then somebody breaks the f- it to like five hours and f- fifty nine minutes. Suddenly, everybody follows. There's a thing you're talking about in running, like when people run or when there's um, uh, records. The record usually like stays very stable, and then someone breaks the record, and then suddenly everybody breaks the record. Yeah, there's more, there's like a weird like a mental thing. For, yeah, from what I understand, like Usain Bolt is an alien, and that that's it's that is a little harder. But yeah, like as soon as someone got the four minute mile, like suddenly everybody did. Like yeah. like nobody could do it, and then one person did it, and then it kind of like broke yeah. it open, and then it's like oh, like you yeah. can do this. Some of it's a brain game. Like, it's a brain game. Yeah. So, like, this stuff has been, like, in my brain for, like, two years. It's ever since I had this, you made with Code Event, the, the, the preparation meeting. And then this code book came out and I was like, ooh, this is kind of neat. Because the idea behind this was, it, how simple can you get it? How simple can you get something that you plug it in and you're ready to code? And they have their own, like, web programming language, which is interesting in and of itself. But it's like got this grid of 25 LEDs, yeah. and you plug stuff in. And it's got two. It's only got like these 25 LEDs, these six pads, and there's two power and th- four signal or something. They're alligator clip compatible, so just like they're bare conductive board, like you clip the alligator pad clips in, oh. and you've got these two buttons, and you and you can program it, and it's very very simple. But it's it's very powerful, and I think they're kind of like, well, what can we do to make it under twenty dollars? And they have a um, their own programming system for it, and it's a mass storage bootloader, so you don't even need a driver. You just plug it in, and you drag a file onto it. And I was like, ooh, this is really, really interesting. And that's kind of when, like, I really started drafting things out. Like, I wasn't, like, making hardware yet, but I was kind of getting this idea, because I'd had this idea of, like, oh, it was a Gemma with a NeoPixel ring. That's kind of what I was thinking of, and that's why all the um, packs were, like, a Gemma with a NeoPixel ring. But then I was like, okay, well, maybe it's... It's something like this where there's a sensors and a chip and then there's LEDs and then there's like pads and this is kind of like bug shaped but maybe mine would be rounded. And then like a few months later there was the announcement for the micro bit, which is another And that was also asked in the chat. What about the micro bit? There's also a twenty dollar board. Also kinda of has this little bit of like an alligator clip type thing going on. Two buttons, actually very micro bit like, which is something we won't cover in this one. You can Google around for that. Yeah. And it also has, um, the front is very similar. It has those five LEDs and then two buttons on the back. It Wait, has. You a, said it was very micro bit like, but this is micro bit. I mean, mean, code bug like. Code bug like. Sorry. So this is, this is like, hey. It's a fork. Hey, instead of it being a bear. It's a bug. It looks like a bear. It's like a square. It's code bear. Code bear, code square. Uh, it looks like a code frog. Look at it, it looks like a frog. It, yeah. It's it's like, like a frog. The eyes is what does yeah. it. And this one has more sensors on it. So the thing with the code bug that was like really neat was like, ooh, okay, so it's like twenty dollars, and it's all in one, and it's very it's, it's designed for people to get started. It's designed to be a giveaway, it's something that you, it, you know, it's with like the lowest cost USB capable pick microcontroller. Mm. Problem is, didn't have any sensors. You could do sensing with it by connecting stuff to the alligator clips, but I kind of like the Pico Board Explora thing where it's like, well, it has something that you can do, mm. not just two buttons. I mean, buttons are good, but I want a little bit more. So the microbit was interesting because they forked off and they did something a little different. They did have the 5 by 5 grid of LEDs, which I was kind of interested by. I was like, okay, it's kind of small, but you can maybe do a little bit with. had two buttons and it had the 5, 6 alligator pads, but on the back it had um, accelerometer, compass, um, any other sensors? Maybe a light sensor? I don't remember off the top of my head. And a Bluetooth Low Energy, which is interesting. It had a radio, which I wasn't really looking at, but I was like, okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, the NRF51, um, you can use that as, as a radio. And it had like an embed chip, the, like M, embed the ARM chip as a program. Oh, everything. So the, the design of it is interesting. And I could, we could have a whole 
session just about like what I think about the design. I think it's um, they released it and they got it out there, so the the design is a success. But I think that the fact that it wasn't Arduino compatible um, at this time, it is like MicroPython compatible, which is I think interesting. But I still think Arduino compatibility is desirable. And the fact that there's these two designs that were able to do this for twenty dollars was like kind of inspired me. I was like, you know what? Instead of just like thinking about this and getting stuck with like, well, you know, no matter what I do, it's going to be fifty dollars. Maybe I should just kind of sit down and design it. Because if they're able to do it, maybe I could do it. Well, you're an engineer. Yeah. This is a concept. Concept. So that was, those are the physical boards. Mm. Um, and then I guess we've been making our boards, Flora and Gemma, and then we had projects. Yeah. So I still wanted to make it wearable because the, one of the things is that I kept seeing was like, okay, if it's wearable, you know, and people can take it with them, it, it's more likely to get more people involved because like everyone yeah. wears clothing. Well, most people are clothing yeah. and people love to have like jewelry and design and how can I make electronics and wearables a way to get to people and what's neat is that we have a lot of wearables projects this was kind of a natural progression so we have like um, you like, know I get to learn but we have like over a hundred wearables tutorials yeah and um, I'll pop over to us right here um, one of the things about wearables that you and I talked about a lot when we decided to do Flora and Gemma and all these projects is when someone makes a wearable, they wear it out. They share it. And they show it and they go out in public. It's not just at in the basement. You know, just like 3D printers, um, they'll print little trinkety things that maybe sit on your shelf. You have to have electronics that go inside the 3D printed enclosures, maybe make something wearable so you take it out and talk about it with others. And so how do you, how do you turn the project itself into a form of distribution and I think um, this is one of the more popular ones uh, a lot of people made these and this is yeah. the LED Amplitie with Flora. So this is one of the first projects, this is one of the projects that when I was designing Flora I was thinking of, is this a project I want, wanted to be able to build so it's an LED reactive tie and you can see the the parts required so you need like you know a bunch of thread and you need a microphone uh, sensor and a bunch of LEDs and some tape and it's it's you know it's a big project, but you can build this tie that you know lights up when you speak, and so yeah. that's kind of one of the projects. That's, and, it's very popular. And what's the term, engineer lady, mm. when <laughs> that uh, even if it's loud, it it self uh, uh, automatic gain control. Yeah, it has automatic gain yeah. control. And so uh, someone sent us a video, and they made one of these, and they were playing the cello on stage at their graduation. They made the ampli tie, yeah. and even though it was noisy. It just wasn't pegged all the way to the top of the tie. Yeah. It was auto gaining. Yeah, it just, it just it, Phil B wrote the code for this, yeah. and um, he did yeah. an amazing job. So, um, <clears throat> other popular ones that I think probably everyone has seen by now um, the Firewalker. Firewalker shoes. sneakers? And these we did with Gemma. Right, so this is a little bit like the Converse. It's yeah. like a shoe based project, uh, and it's got the Gemma. I see what you're doing there. You're like, I'm going to figure out a way to do this for lower cost and make it simpler. Yeah, so the problem with these, is we have two versions, and this is the Gemma version, and even this one requires soldering mm -hmm. and a lot of stitching. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're not, probably not going to have something that's going to be perfect, but can I get the concept of this project? without mm. needing any soldering. Like, what kind of sensors do I need to do this project? So the Amplitude with a sound sensor, this one is like a motion yeah. or um, vibration sensor. Okay, and then we had a drum project. And this was one where uh, people go and see music. And this is kind of a, maybe a variation of the tie, but it uses Gemma. It's a little, it's a little bit a variation because it's, um, it's, it's just a reacting yeah. to it. But it's still a very popular yeah. project. And it's Gemma based, but like you can see, like okay, there's a, there's a lot of similarities. You have this microcontroller, you have a sensor, and you have LEDs. Yeah, and then you know I'm going to skip around a little bit, but you know later on we started making rings and more with NeoPixels, and of course we had a project. Your yeah. Pulse displayed with NeoPixels. So what's interesting is that you can actually because one of the things about wearable electronics is, um, and we'll talk about this more when we do the parts analysis but you want to have a display of some sort and the micro bit and the code bug have this five by five led grid which you can kind of scroll text by on but mm -hmm. i was thinking because all these you know i don't want to have like it would be great if i could have like a color tft but it's not it's not realistic like that's actually before i even got to the later stages i knew that i'm not gonna be able to have like a 
like mm. an iPhone display or even iWatch display. Like these are very, very expensive components and they're very delicate. So can you display things? Can you have a reactive device using only LEDs? And this was an interesting project by um, I think Mike Borella where it's a pulse sensor but it uses like a heartbeat pulsing LED rather than um, actually displaying the pulse. And this was still a very interesting project. So, you know, even though it's like, oh, like if you have a pulse sensor, you want to print out like five, six, 56 pulse per minute, maybe there's ways to indicate that using a simpler interface. Yeah. And for, you think about that. For the, for the um, Adafruit fans, later on, Circuit Playground, that's a real thing now, was able to do some bio analysis. It's a bio hacking device already. Yeah. And this is kind of a neat preview. Your pulse display with NeoPixels, well, what if you can get your pulse with other things besides a pulse sensor? Yeah, and so this, this project, you know, it, it's, it's a, for a pulse sensor, it's actually pretty low cost, but altogether, I think these parts is like $60 a part. You have yeah. to solder all these parts and wire them and and it's it's great because you have an if you have an Arduino and you have a NeoPixel ring, it's yeah. quite simple. And now we're back to sixty bucks again. But so, we, uh, yeah, a lot of the projects yeah. we do, it's very hard to get away from this like fifty to sixty dollar yeah. cost. Okay, and then uh, another example of the wearable projects that we do. This yeah, was this a sparkle is script. this is another project that when I designed Flora, I thought of as like we should make this project. It's a it's a twinkling skirt that twinkles more, lights up more as you dance. Yeah. And so you have a flora, you have a bunch of neopixels, and you have an accelerometer, a motion sensor. So like looking at all these projects, I started to get like, okay, almost all these projects have you know, this wearable processor, they have neopixels, they have some sort of sensing, and there's motion sensing, sound sensing, light sensing, temperature sensing. So as I look at all these projects, there wasn't one, or like, you know, pulse sensing. Yeah. I mean, color sensing, like the the... A chameleon scarf. I didn't even put in all the tutorials. This all makes sense. Now. The chameleon scarf is actually a very popular one yeah. as well. Well, people are supposed to like hear things and, and go and explore mm. learn.adafruit.com. Yeah. But you can see a little piece of each. Um, one of the things for the people who, um, this might be the first time they've been thinking about how they might come up with concepts. Um, here's kind of the end result with Flora. This is one of our boards. This is the latest Flora where it has a NeoPixel embedded on it. Yeah, so we've we've had Flora for like five years now, yeah. and it's our wearable board that you know we use for wearable projects, and it's the core of all of these tutorials. Um, almost all of them use the Flora, yeah. and the Flora has worked out really well. So having something similar to the Flora kind of lets me um, borrow the hundreds of projects that already exist. So you know, there's always the option of starting from scratch, but you know, if, if, you're, if you're designing a, a project or a product, you know, there's, there's a technical debt. There's also a, it's good and bad. Yeah. Technical debt can be, okay, well, you've designed something and now you're stuck with it. It can also be, well, why pay more for something you yeah. already have? If you already have a design that works quite well, can you use that? Also, because of the way we roll, um, when do you have to educate and retrain all of your customers, all your staff, redo all your tutorials, or is there a way to carry forward some of that learnings? Yeah. Can you learn something once and apply it forward? And I think um, you know, Arduino is a good example. Like, if you've played around with any Arduino, Flora can work for you. Right. And Flora, yeah, Flora is based off this Arduino ecosystem. So, yeah. like, basing off of an existing ecosystem is powerful. I mean, it's like forking it to make a new standard. You know, you can do that, and that's kind of what happened with the code bug and micro bit, which was, which I understand. They're like, well, we're going to start from scratch, but there's trade offs with that. Yeah. So um, you don't get you don't get the decade of projects that already happened. To yeah. you know, you don't get to borrow from them. And we also came up with the Gemma, which was our response to having a lower cost version of. Uh, Flora, um, a lot of people prototype with Flora, and then when they're ready to deploy their project, they'll do it on yeah. you know, Gemma. Hi. Um, yeah. yeah, so the, the thing with the Gemma, and I thought about this, like maybe I should just make a board that's like the Gemma, which which would work. The, the issue is that it's, it is constrained. Um, even if I say, use that same microcontroller, it's really hard to do like 
complicated sensing. Like it could probably act like a code bug. Um, and it is a very low cost chip. But I also wanted to make sure that it was fully functional and like the Gemma, it doesn't sometimes like USB 3 ports. And so, yeah. you know, we, we talked about it and I was like, well, even though you get cost savings, it's maybe not worth it. And we'll talk about this more in research as well, the next few steps. But even though this was an interesting concept, this is a very, very small board, I actually thought that making something larger with more things in it would be more powerful. Yeah. Assuming we could get the, mm. the price point. I mean, you know, there's other costs, and we can talk about this in future episodes. You know, you get things CE and FCC certified. Oh, we, I'll talk we, about that. Oh, yeah. Like, y'all buckle your seatbelts because we're going to show everything. Show you how to do that. Yeah. That's so, fun. So the other part of this is, um, as I mentioned before, you came up with NeoPixels. Yeah, the NeoPixel rings were basically designed just to make NeoPixel goggles. Um, but they became extremely popular. I mean, like, again, it's like nobody had ring-shaped yeah. RGB LEDs, and then suddenly everybody has ring-shaped RGB LEDs, um, which is cool. And, you know, it's, it's a really good idea. People love these, these circles of light. And so when I was first thinking of the concept of um, Circuit Playground, I actually thought it would be a Gemma in the center of a NeoPixel ring. That's kind of what yeah. I thought, because there were so many projects that were like, well, if you're going to have NeoPixels, why don't you put them in a ring and then you can have, you know, it's elegant and it's symmetric. Um, you know, one of our most popular projects is the NeoPixel goggles. Yeah. So, um, you know, and here's Vance uh, modeling the, uh, the, this is like the Batman edition of yeah. NeoPixel goggles. Vance leads our reflow and also he's uh, running the pick and place machine. He's running the pick and place machine. And yeah. probably has an encyclopedic knowledge of Spider-Man Captain America. Way more than I do. Captain America. He's, and, he loves the Captain America. Yeah. And so um, we see these goggle projects everywhere. Yeah. Kind of our calling card with NeoPixels now. The only thing is I actually couldn't quite get Circuit Playground to be like, you know, as small as the, the NeoPixel goggles. We can goggle. get goggles made. But you can, you can kind of do yeah. similar stuff. We'll, we'll figure something out. Maybe a, so we have a other. TR or something. But the, the, the idea of a ring... Yeah. Um, and Circuit Playground is not even done. Like I have ideas for the next version already. It is. It is developer edition. And things you know, may change. One of the things that um, because we're still talking about concept now is this is kind of a preview of our site updates. Yeah. So the end result was Circuit Playground, and we're in developer edition mode. And so, I know. It's just kind of funny because we get to like at the end. Here's what it ended up being. So yeah. So that was. That was an interesting journey. So that was the, the concept. Uh, and we'll go into the specifics. We'll do uh, parts and analysis and um, evaluation. You tried every different part, um, the design, prototyping. Distribution. Yeah. And um, make it for a production, make distribution, it... support. Mm -hmm. You know, we did all this stuff. But one of the cool things is the history of it. This has been 10 years in the making all the way back to, and I visited you, when you were at iBeam, doing these workshops, and it was, um, I think, probably fulfilling, but boy, 30 people at soldering irons and, you know, pouring out a bag of parts, that's tough. Yeah, and it's it was funny, at the time, about. it was like, well, what can you do for 20 bucks? And I was like, well, you could do a TV yeah. be gone. But, you know, if I'd had something like Circuit Playground, that would've been way better. I'd been like, hey, yeah. there's, there's all these things that we, you know, we can start out with a basic project, but then they can take it home and continue. And that's yeah. also another thing is when, you know, I don't have a slide for this, but when we went to the White House and we talked to a lot of other educators, people working at fab labs and, and groups and communities, one of the things they said was challenging was that they'd have kids come to the fab lab or come to the school or come to the workshop, but they wouldn't get to take something home with them. Yeah, what did you do today? Um, nothing. You know, they, <laughs> they, would, they would build something that, you know, they'd use a Makey Makey or they would yeah. use an Arduino but then they wouldn't get to take it home with them because it was for the class or for the school. And so the ability of somebody to take it home with them and work on it at home, that's because it's, you know, the kids learn in class, but they also learn outside of class. If you can get it so that they have this board with them, you know, like, you know, I, I learned, you learn computers in class, right? I took, I took, you know, computer science in school with an Apple II, but because I was um, lucky and privileged enough to have a computer at home, I got to play with a computer at home, which is where I really learned, right? Yeah. Like, they're not going to let you run ResEdit in school. If you want to do that, if you want to program, if you, you know, it takes hours and hours and hours, 
getting a taste of it and then taking it home and then exploring it at your leisure yeah. is very powerful. And so a lot of the people we spoke to at this, um, this uh, Champions of Change event and also the, the Maker Faire um, and the manufacturing um, summit that they were having is how can we get people to be able to take it home? So this is, yeah. this is all in one. How can you make it simple, small, low cost, but have dozens of ideas and projects that you can do with yeah. it? Be, be simple yet um, deep. Okay. Well, what do you do? Thank you for doing the concept. There's a few questions. Whew. Yeah, I'm of course. I'm going to ask a few here. I'm going to hydrate. Yeah, so why don't you uh, hydrate while I go okay. to the slide here? All right. So, uh, Sorry. Um, so when you're doing the concept phase, you know, this 10-year, 5-year, 2-year, even like within the last couple of years, do you, immediately, do you immediately jump to Eagle CAD? Like, what, do you keep it in your head? Do you have a notebook? Like, how do you hold that concept um, and carry it forward? Uh, mm. um, I do sometimes write down on, like, notepads, like a little piece of paper. I just start drawing out, like, what it is I want. So you do it on paper first? I do. I Sometimes I do it on paper. Is that um, what all those little post-it note things that I yeah, see here with all these funny note. symbols? There's a lot of, yeah, symbols. There's schematics. Mm. Um, sometimes I do that. Sometimes what I'll actually start doing is, um, not necessarily with this one, but with other projects, I'll actually start specking parts before even jumping to Eagle. So like I'll pop up like a site like DigiKey, and I'll start looking up, okay, well, what's a microcontroller that, or what's a sensor that can do X, Y, and Z, and how much does mm. it cost? to get an idea of like, is this even like- Okay, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, fire up your browser and, browser and go to DigiKey and do what you just said. Okay. If you don't mind. Okay, so let's- uh, Okay. So for example- uh, I'm sorry for th just throwing a curveball at you, but- No, no, it's fine. Okay. So like for example, you know, I wanted to add, um, you know, think about what sensors can I add. So for example, I wanted to do projects in motion. Okay. So, so you're like, let me okay. just let me just see. Let me just see. Right. So I'm like, okay. Well, I want What's to accelerometer. Frozen? I want to accelerometer. Well, there's there's a lot of motion sensors. Um, there's vibration sensors, but let's say I want an accelerometer, so I can actually do tilt and physics. So I'll, I'll look up like uh, accelerometer, which I can't spell. I think that's how you spell it. Maybe it's two L's. No, it's one L. So um, so I'll click on you know accelerometers, and then I will totally do um, the. I'll, I'll kind of so I'll be like, okay, well, I want to make something that has full X, Y, Z um, acceleration. And so I'll like uh, pick a X, Y, Z and then these axes. Because, you know, if, if an accelerometer, like when I first started, accelerometer is 20 bucks. If it's 20 bucks, I, I'm not going to be able to do it. Okay. Um, analog or digital, I don't care. Acceleration range, I don't think this is too important. Um, you know, I'll eventually figure out. This is like a packaging. preview of a future episode of like specking out parts, but 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 in your concept phase, you're doing this too, right? And then you just want to see. And then when I do it, I look it up, and I'm like, okay, this is actually it's funny. I didn't even. Oh, there's a reason why I didn't pick this one, but I can see here that accelerometers are going to cost me like sixty cents. So mm -hmm. if this popped up and said twenty bucks, like some sensors, they just happen to be more expensive. I'd be like, okay. That's not going to work. I got to find a different solution mm. for that. But um, if it's fifty cents, I'm like, okay, like that's good. Okay, now I want to have like a sound sensor, so um, you know I can look up, you know, microphones. And then when you look up microphones, sixteen hundred choices. And then I sort by price. I love the sort by price. It's kind of all I do. Um, it's like chipping away. Like the, the, the circuit playground was already there. You just chipped away the parts you weren't going to use. <laughs> right. So then it's like, okay, well, there is, um, you know, this MEMS accelerometer, uh, the MEMS microphone. Okay, it's 30 cents. And we talk about like it has to be reflow, and that's why I didn't use an ele Electret, which is more, less expensive. You can use an Electret, Electret mic. So this is like kind of how I think about it. I'm like, okay, well, what, what sensors can you use? Um, you know, Electret mic is, actually they're not that less expensive. So it turns out the MEMS microphone is less expensive. Sometimes Electret, Electret mics, if you buy them on the Chinese market, can be very, very cheap, but you have to hand solder them. So like, you know, as you do your manufacturing design, you think about that. And then, you know, let's say I wanted a potentiometer. Um, 
So I look up, you know, potentiometer, and then I want an SMT potentiometer because later on we'll talk about this. I want it to be no through hole requirements. So then um, maybe I'll do, the thing is here, there's no slide potentiometer. There's trimmer, joystick, rotary, thumb wheel, um, digital excision. I don't want that. Let's, let's just say trimmer. So when you look up the trimmer pots, oh, click the wrong thing. Sorry, let me. You know, trim pots are 10 cents, but the problem is they're, you know, you look at the photo, you're like, oh, that's really small. Like, no kid's going to, like, you need to have a knob, but none of these yeah. have that. So it's okay. like, okay, that gets um So part of your out. concept process is just like, do I even want to go down a path? Can I go down a path? And then when it's closed off, that's the end of that path, go for something else. But if there's an opening, it's like, well, I might be able to get... Yeah, like having the accelerometer, like, you know, because I was like, oh, how much accelerometers cost? But seeing that it's like 50 cents, I'm like, oh, okay. Mm. Now that, that opens up this possibility because I'm so budget constrained. But I can also look yeah. up the other design, like all those things that were inspiring to me. And you like, you look up the Explora and you're like, well, what, what does the Explora use? Yeah. Or what does... Oh, so in the concept have? phase, you might plug in the physical parts that you see on these boards, and you're like, well, how much did they get them for? Right. Oh, so, okay. like... Um, so it's probably uh, good advice for people to pick up some of these boards from others. Yeah. Just to, just, to, just to kick the tires on them. Okay, so for example, you've got this like digital sandbox, and they don't have... Okay, so you can look up the schematic. Yeah, it's a so great you're thing. like, hello. And then you're like, okay, well, what, what, yeah. you know, what's being used here? Okay, so there's a temperature sensor, the MCP... Um, MCP 9700. So you can start with that way too. You can like go there, uh, not a value finishing board, the actual sensor. And you're like, okay, this is like a 20 cent sensor. So like you, you have some idea of what you're starting with when you look at other designs or like this light sensor um, or how the microphone is done. Like all these things, like looking at how other people do things is inspiring and interesting and can like give you ideas for what you might want to do. Or like, a, you know, a, like I really wanted to have, you know, every other board had a slide potentiometer. And then she, um, and so, you know, I looked up slide potentiometers and it's not that they were expensive, they're actually pretty inexpensive. Um, you know, 46 cents, 50 cents. Let me pick one that's in stock so we can see a photo. Um, but they were all through hole. So just looking at the photos, I was like, yeah. oh, they're through hole, or they're like, you know, it's not going to be less than a dollar fifty. That makes it a little bit tougher to use. Okay. And then, so it sounds like in the concept planning, you're looking at other boards. You're looking at the things that you made. You're looking probably constantly, because I see you on the DigiKey site doing that thing all the time, and you're uh, consistently and constantly looking at um, this imaginary price point, all the features. So you're, the concept phase is, is like, this is what probably the inside of your head looks like. The, the thing is, is that, you know... <laughs> like, you got a lot of stuff going on here. So DigiKey has this, like, you know, the, the Maker.io is, is, has this, like, step-by-step, -step, like, one through ten. But that's not how, you know, like, of course, it's, it's never... You skip around. Like you a, skip yeah. around. Like, you, I'll jump to... Um, it's, almost, it's almost like um, uh, you could fill these in as you get to them. Like, oh, I'm like, I'm already, you know, in the evaluation part, but I'm also doing research and concept, and then I'm doing design. So. Right, so, like, this is a research step, but I do it yeah. at the concept phase because I'm like, well, as I'm looking at all these things, like, what... What do they do and how do they do it? Looking at the schematics, looking at their chips, looking at what the bill of materials is. As an engineer, I kind of skip forward a little bit to like that part, and then I will like wind back to to do concept. Yeah. So um, a, a few people have some observations. Um, they said one of the biggest hurdles is going from beginner electronics to the online part suppliers, and so we'll actually have uh, an episode about that. If you ever want to see an expert. Uh, how do I point in that way? There's two of me. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that happens once in a while. That's Sorry funny. That, folks. Um, I'm a super expert. Yeah, <laughs> if you ever want to see someone <clears throat> spin around on the DigiKey site, for instance, um, Lady yeah. Ada is, is an expert. 
Um, and then um, folks say that there's a gap between um, the part sites and then the, the getting there as a beginner. It's just overwhelming the amount of information. Yeah. This so is, how do you filter that? This is, you know, what Adafruit does, which is kind of what we do for a living, right? We, we kind of pick out the most popular sensors and make breakouts for them yeah. in tutorials. But that's, and that's good for conceptual. We'll talk about that in, the, in the, you know, in R&D, where you can, you know, like, I have one of each of the boards that we talked about. Well, not all of them, but I have, like, almost all of those boards that we talked about, and I play with them to get an idea of how they work. And that's, that's part of your research and part of your conceptualization is looking what exists because you want to make sure whatever you make is a unique piece in this puzzle. Yeah. But then as you use it, you have to, you, you know, if you want to go to manufacture, you, you have to be, you know, a 10K resistor is good for everything. When you go to manufacture, you have to make sure it's exactly right 10K resistor. Yeah. And you can use... And then you have to design for manufacturing, not design for one-off and kits and prototyping. And when cost Different. is important yeah. and usability is important, you want to make sure that you have you know reliable sources. So you can't use just like some random part. You have to make sure that um, you know they're exactly you know they're exactly the right component. They're the right size. They have the right tolerance. They can survive your manufacturing. That they can survive usability. Um, a lot of choices get made. Yeah. Okay, Lady. Well, that's concept. I think yeah. one day people are going to look back at these series of videos and say. I get, I get it because we're not just. This isn't a theoretical thing. Like, no offense to the startup e accelerator things where it's all theoretical and there actually isn't, um, you know, successful products in the market. It's like, oh, you're going to design hardware, but there's no like case study or physical thing that you can say, well, show me the bill of materials, show me the concept, show me the design. I think people are going to look back at these videos and say, okay, it's okay to look at other sites. It's okay to look at boards. It's okay to yeah, go... Yeah, this, this is never yeah. discussed. Like most like Kickstarters, they never say like, well, there was this other thing. Yeah. They always say like the alternative. And I'm like, no, this, when, when I design should... boards, I look at what's going on because mm -hmm. I want to make... I, I don't want to... I don't want to clone something, right? It doesn't make sense. Like, it doesn't make sense for me to make another code bug that's exactly the same. It doesn't make sense for me to make the exact same Pico board. If I'm going to yeah. do something, it should be different and cover the usage. And But, you know, by the way, if there was a board out there that did all the things that I wanted that was available for $20, I would just tell people to use it. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes you get down a path and it's just like, well... Maybe we need to come up with something to compete with ourselves. So Gemma, uh, one of the things that we thought was funny is like, well, floor is great. So let's make something better. But let's compete with ourselves. Yeah, like this, you know, this is actually an issue. Like, you know, Flora, I've got to think about what's the future of Flora because yeah. if Circuit Playground has all the functionality of Flora, or almost all of it, I have to, yeah. you know, I have to differentiate yeah. it. Yeah, we got this going on right now. And we got one of these going on right now. And the interesting thing is... Um, while this looks like a wearable and it can be a wearable, the Flora is more geared towards wearable and it, it will be more tuned for... It's smaller. Yeah. It has a different power path. It's an on-off switch. Um, yeah. It's a little bit different. Yeah. And just, sure. it, just geared for different things. And it's okay if you look at mature uh, markets, there is a whole range of laptops and phones and tablets. Not, yeah. One size doesn't always fit all. Yeah, but that's definitely part of your concept. Look at look at what's out there, and see how you you're similar and how you differentiate. And if there's something that already fits what you're doing, I mean, did, you can still do it. There's you know, there's never, especially in hardware, there's never anything wrong with just making something that's okay. Like, hey, I'm going to make a, a version of the Pico board. I'm going to make a version of the Explorer. Yeah. But it would be if you're going to do something. I think that especially if you want to get market reach, you have to um, be disruptive either in price or functionality or usability or something. Taco M8 or Taco Mate has a question, but I think we're going to save this one for a future one. It says, would you specify down to components and manufacture as to build materials to execute, or do you just provide a design and they handle the selection within your design parameters? Kind of curious how engineering works in that realm. Well, for us, I'll answer just a little part of this. For us, we do the manufacturing, so we're not sending something off right. to someone. So we're in a better position, maybe a slightly... Uh, higher stakes position. Um, Design because, for manufacture for us is a circle. Yeah, it's it's not it's not the final yeah, step. Lady it's sits a, ten feet from the picking place. Immediate, yeah, I sit next to the picking place, and when we did the first round of circuit playgrounds, 
um, <clears throat> I, I checked the yield and I checked how they were coming out and whether the test procedure was working. Mm. And like the first set of boards, I think we got like a yield of like 70 or 80% uh, for the first 80 boards and they sold that really fast. Yeah. And um, then we got much better at, at testing, we documenting how to manufacture them, like figuring out the, the picking place and the stencils and everything. Um, the first round of boards had um, bad uh, mask. It's like, you know, we'll talk about that. It happens. Um, but then we fixed that up, and then, the, you know, the, the future versions um, became much better, and now we have, yeah. like, 99% yield. Yeah. Okay. My, I mean, my impression, hearing all this at once, I mean, you know, we walk around New York City together and, and talk about ideas, and then, you know, years later, we, we bring them to market. Like, you, you tell me sometimes, send me, send me an email about this. And we respond to to-dos from each other from five and ten years ago. Yeah, those ago. are fun. I don't yeah. think we ever sent an email about, I need something that's a $20. No, we just wearable. knew. We no, we knew. just heard it. Yeah. It was always just percolating. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is the first one. Um, success. Um, this is the Maker I.O. Powered by DigiKey concept episode. Again, we're going to have nine more of these. Covering all these. So save your Research, questions. Research, evaluation, design, prototyping, funding, marketing, production, distribution, and support. We're doing this. Um, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why am I here? Well, the demand for Circuit Playground is going to be more than we can probably handle. So we wanted to work with a launch partner, it's Maker.io and DigiKey. DigiKey stocks Circuit Playground. You do. So for all the people who want sh a shipping option we don't offer, for all the uh, schools that already have ways to buy stuff from DigiKey, all the things yeah, that... Yeah, they're in all the, like, the purchase order systems. Ugh. Yeah, all oh, the things that we don't want to get distracted with, we're going to, hopefully, have uh, uh, Maker.io powered by DigiKey, DigiKey, um, do that. And then the other thing is we wanted to get to know some of the big suppliers um, before we kind of place some bets on them. So uh, we really like DigiKey. Uh, if you want to see an interview, Lady Ada interviewed Dave Doherty, the CEO of DigiKey. I believe this is the first time that he's done an interview, engineer to engineer. And then we also got our hands on the DigiKey. Yeah, we had it in our grubby yeah. nets. Yeah, and so we had it, and uh, we filmed it, and they made it made us give it back. I but, might make a DigiKey at a circuit playground. Yeah, we could. Okay. And the neat thing is the DigiKey display that they have. It goes through all the logos, um, and it has the original DigiKey. And uh, that's where the name came from. And the company is an engineering company, privately held. Uh, Adafruit is kind of like a little tiny version of DigiKey. So the values that uh, DigiKey had to people that are there were important to us, especially if we're going to release something like Circuit Playground that's going to possibly go to millions of young people. Like, that's our goal. How can we, how can we get it to as many people as possible who maybe never thought about engineering or art or science in 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 a, in a in context of mm -hmm. electronics. Okay, that's cool. All right, all right. that's concept. Thanks for joining any us. Any other folks. questions? Are we questioning? No, them? you covered them all. Oh yay! You covered them all, and uh, thank you everyone in the chat who uh, asked great questions. And uh, we'll be here uh, next week, Saturday night, uh, 10 p.m. again. We'll do the next one. You know what engineers are doing on Saturday nights? videos looking at engineering stuff that's what my experience they're on they're on sites like digigay like searching for parts and stuff so. yeah doing cad layout and stuff yeah okay all right well that was the desk of Lady Ada for tonight okay thanks for watching everybody stay tuned for the next nine videos Woo! it's exciting yeah we'll have other stuff too and other stuff and our yeah we might do a ham sunday tomorrow ham radio oh yeah I got, I yeah got actually uh the 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 digikeer has ham radio roots Full circle. Like a NeoPixel. Bye, everybody. <laughs> bye, bye.